Welcome back for another helping of oysters, clams, and cockles. I am your host, Ross Bolin, joined today by Barris Targaryen, Barrett Dudley, who now has silver hair. That's right. That's right. Um, shouts to all the patrons out there who who already know this fact about me. Um, yeah, I'm, 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 I j- actually just renewed my driver's license yesterday. And so I just changed the spelling of Barrett. You know, it's now B A E R E T. Uh, you know, a, a, as as Germ would have written it if if I were a character in in the books, just busting up through the boards and on my dragon. That's like Bayret. Bay would be yeah. your nickname. That's true. That's because that is how they do Baylon, right? That's a B A E. So like Jace, but Bay. Right. Right. Yeah. Bay, we're doing a. Yeah. We're doing today's episode on Zoom together because of a COVID exposure threat, so we apologize for the change in audio quality. I'm in all black and wearing sunglasses because I'm in in mourning, rest in peace, King Viserys, and because I am officially (laughs) positioning myself on Team Black. So we've got Barrett with the legitimate Targaryen silver hair now. He has actually Um, dyed his hair all the way silver, as he said. Everyone on Patreon.com slash Oysters, Clams, Cockles already knows this. But we're in we're in good costume spirits today for uh you know a mid October episode. Yeah, I I agree. It is uh it is officially spooky season. We are we're only a couple of weeks away from from Halloween. Uh, but but right now I have no plans to go as a Targaryen to any type of Halloween themed event. So uh, you know that's it's it's I'm just living my life as a Targaryen. It's not you know this this shit ain't a game to me. I'm I'm it's the real thing. <laughs> my co-host on the Ross <laughs> Boland podcast suggested that. Uh, a good Halloween costume from tonight's episode would be the people who tend to the Viserys's body to his corpse that have those like boards that come up behind their heads, <laughs> whatever those things are, that that would be a good costume. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but, who, who are they representing in there? Is that the, um, the, the stranger or are they all, they're all followers of the stranger? I believe so. They represent him in some fashion when they tend to the body. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm Ross, I'm 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 disappointed that I can't obviously be in person because it's it you know, referencing arrest development um is just not gonna be the same on, on today's episode when I can't, you know, see your face up close and personal uh when we get to start talking about boy fights. I know, man. The kid <laughs> fights. <laughs> Those are the best. Let's get into it though. Let's go straight into this episode. We open up with the empty throne room. It's like, I, I love the tension they build around the beginning of this thing because they know it's the penultimate. They know we're all coming in expecting things to be big, right? So you've got the empty throne room, the empty council room, the empty everything, really, just taking us around the Red Keep. And then there's some kid walking around, and we kind of follow him. He delivers a message to someone. Then that message finds its way to Alicent, who cries upon hearing, and she says, stay here, tell no one. What we end up finding out is that this is immediately in the aftermath of Viserys Targaryen passing away. And that's the news that's been delivered to her, that the king is in fact dead. And uh, yeah, so Alicent goes to tell Otto, tells him that her handmaiden and some of the servants are the only ones who know so far. And she also tells Otto that Viserys' last words were that he wanted Aegon to be king, which is obviously where we kind of left off after episode eight, right? So things start off literally in the immediate aftermath of Viserys' death. Is this the first time we've done that this season, where we went from one episode's ending directly into the next episode's beginning? Um, man, it's, it's, it might be the first time. This definitely felt like the, the, the shortest amount of time in between episodes. You know, this is... I, I think we had one earlier in the season at some point that was maybe like a few days after or a month after. But this was like essentially picked up, picked up right where the last one left off. So it was a, a true continuation, um, which, which definitely felt different, felt like a change and felt good, honestly. It did feel good and something that we can, I think, expect to get used to, if not these immediate aftermath episodes, um, you know, much smaller time jumps as we've been, uh, as the Internet has indicated. Apparently, we're not going to be dealing with time jumps at all in season two. So we have a council meeting to announce the king's death and someone rolls which lannister is it on the council that's that's old thailand lannister thailand, thailand lannister so yes, someone yes. rolls no, him his ball not to be confused with tanner lannister mind you right 
Of course, that, not. I don't. I don't. I don't want any confusion of, of, about that because Tanner Lannister, wild child that he may he, that he might be, you know, and everybody does know that about him that he is, you know, a loose cannon and 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 just really can't be tamed. He's very unpredictable like that. But he would never. He would never stoop so low as as to be a you know a conniving traitor like Tylen Lannister here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the second that they roll him the ball, though, I was like, okay, I lo- like we're giving a lot of attention to these things. This is to, ba- to the balls. Yeah, to the little marbles yeah. that they get that that I thought were eggs back in episode one. Uh huh. Um, yeah. So Tar- I mean, they are as they are as plain as the egg on Ant's face. So <laughs> it's you know <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> uh, so Thailand says that. They can now, after Otto tells the council about Viserys' final wishes as Alicent interpreted them, um, Tyland is like, well, good. Now we can go along with our our plans that we've been, you know, hoping for all along. Basically just flat out tells everybody else on the council that there's been this side team, the Greens, scheming all along. Which, Which really puts everybody that was not in on this in like a very precarious situation right here. Um, that you know obviously uh, rears its ugly head shortly, uh, shortly thereafter, shortly after this announcement is made. But here's a question for you, right? Like, if they let's what what if Viserys hadn't like misspoken to Alicent while you know while thinking that he was talking to Rhaenyra? Like, what if they didn't even have this little you know this little piece to go off of, right? This little you know moment. So like, it sounds gonna- like. It sounds were they like just going to make this shit up anyway. It sounds like they were just going to do this anyway. They were going to yeah. find a way no matter what. So in in one way it sort of absolves Viserys's absurd last words to Alicent because I don't know that he is the end all be all thing that kicked this off. I right, think it would have right. happened anyway. It well, obviously w- gives her it gives Alicent the reasoning she needs to be full party to it, but I think Otto was going to do it regardless. Yeah, and and I think this this moment here in the small council is, is like it's 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 an interesting point for this episode, especially because it starts to split the paths of Otto and Allison. Right? It's like they 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 kind of up until this point, we kind of think that they're on the same team with the with a common goal. They both want the same thing. And moving forward after this scene, and, and even during it, they do they they kind of are after the the same thing still, but they both intend to go about it in completely different ways, which is there, there are, you know, this is such a family show. They say that in uh, in the inside the episode that this season is all about the dissolution of a family. And like it, 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 there are, there are these fissures and cracks, you know, not only, you know, straight down the, the, the dividing line here between the blacks and the greens, but also we start to see all these little ones in the family as well, whether it's between Allison and Otto or later, um, you know, something that we kind of predicted starts coming to fruition as well with the Amond and Aegon, uh, you know, break as well. So that it's it's kind of a, a, re- a recurring theme in this episode that that begins right here in the small council room. Very good point. And the fra- the 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 phrase in the factions are are something that I didn't really expect um, to get into much in season one. I, I anticipated that obviously with all with as many people involved as we have. There would inevitably be phrase within the factions, but they're really, like you said, starting to show here in the penultimate episode, particularly between Otto and Alicent, as you said. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Beesbury, Lord Beesbury is really upset. He's one of the guys on the council who's blindsided by this whole thing. He did not realize that people were plotting and scheming uh, about this the entire time. Um, he says he does not believe Alicent that the king's last wishes were to install Aemon. He says this is seizure, it is theft, it is treason. He goes so far as to infer that perhaps the king did not die of natural causes. That uh, And I think, by the way, the fact that there is this faction of people, you know, Tywin Lannister included, or Tywin Lannister, excuse me, included, that have been scheming this entire time on Viserys' downfall, it lends even further weight to our theory, my theory at the very least, that, that, Otto and the Maesters, as we discussed on Patreon.com slash Oysters, Clams, Cockles last mm. week, have in fact been tinkering and toying with Viserys' health, at the very least not helping him heal and yeah. and kind of, you know, providing him lubricant on the slide down to death, I would say. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and I mean, like we, we, we spoke to this last week and, and more on the Patreon episode, I believe, but like certainly if if causing his death was not the intention... 
having him laid up and and you know basically unable to do anything uh was very very beneficial to the greens that let them install all of these plans and and come up with all this bullshit absolutely uh so beesbury stands up out of anger and Kristen cole sits him right back down and smashes his face into his marble (laughs) so he dies yeah, yeah, temple to the uh to the marble leg. It's a it's a rough way to go. Yeah, the temple, not the not the face, excuse me, smashes his temple straight into the marble and then he just they leave him there. So for the rest of the meeting, you've got Beesbury yeah. face down or on the side, head head to the side, head down, dead. Yeah. I, I look, I th- I think that we knew, you know, obviously the entirety of the internet and and including us on this podcast here we are no fan of of Kristen Cole. You know what I mean. He is he has been with reason a very a very hated man. But I thought I thought this was this was especially telling, right? That this guy is not only you know a loyalist to the to the usurpers here, um, and an extremely bitter and uh, and childish ex, which nobody likes. But he's also kind of like a rabid dog. Like he's kind of a loose cannon wild, you know, like, I mean, like all we got to do is rewind to the Joffrey lawnmower incident. But here again, he just like this dude will snap. You know what I mean? Yes, you're not wrong. Like, this is the second time we've seen it. He murdered Joffrey Lawnmower. In fr- and again, it's a very brazen act of murder in both yes. instances where it's in front yes. of a very large public audience. In this case, a very sacred institution, the small council. And he murders somebody flat out doing their job at the table into their, like, their, his marbles in his head now. It's like Westworld <laughs> for this guy. So, yeah, um, but, but dude, I mean, like, I don't know if I can name a larger heel turn in, in, in Westeros history than this guy who, like, you know, after the two episodes, we're like, oh, God, this Kristen Cole, man, he's great. I know. Usually they tip you off early with the with the bad guy characters, but he's one yes. that really snuck up on us where we thought, I mean, we were really stoked on him and Rhaenyra's uh, uh, fraternal relationship. We were <laughs> we were all over like, I mean, because he looked he seemed like a good dude who came from nothing, earned his way up and was was genuinely um, loyal to Rhaenyra. We just didn't realize that his definition of loyalty is a lot different than than we anticipated. Yeah, yeah. So he ends up drawing his sword on the Lord Commander here, which, I mean, if you hated Kristen Cole before, things are only getting worse, like you said. Uh, Very tense moment here between Lord Commander Westerling and Kristen Cole that ends without violence, obviously. But, yeah, I mean, as I said, Otto Hightower does not even let them remove the body of Beesbury. He says, the doors stay closed until we finish our business. Allison immediately brings up Rhaenyra, uh, what's going to happen with her. Otto says her and her family will be given the opportunity to publicly swear fealty to their new king. And Alicent point blank says, oh my God, you mean to kill them all? And then orders Lord... There's like conversation about what to do next. And then Otto orders Lord Commander Westerling to take his knights to Dragonstone. Now, is that to get Rhaenyra? Yes. yes. I, I basically, you know, um, took that to mean, hey, you got to go SEAL Team 6, the entirety of of, uh, of Rhaenyra and Damon's family. So Westerling is like, no, I'm not down to do this, takes off his cloak, lays it down and says, look, until there's a king, I have no place here. And they let him leave. And I was kind of surprised to see him survive this episode as a result, because it seemed like they were just going to do away with anybody who was in their way. And obviously, they were very keen on not allowing anyone to leave King's Landing, which leads to our huge ending of this episode, obviously. Yeah, it, it definitely, it, I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I was wondering if he was going to be able to walk out of that room as well, uh, or if, you know, Kristen, Kristen was immediately going to be installed as the new King Guard, and there was going to be like a big, another big showdown between them. But I, I think we'll have to wait for, a, for another episode for that one. Um, uh, it, it was kind of like, I don't want to say cool necessarily, but if you remember back to Game of Thrones, there there is like this level of of um of respect for the King's Guard in that like they are impartial essentially, or at least supposed to be, and it's they they are you know the, truly servants of the realm. 
So they're really not supposed to pick or choose sides in, in this type of instance, or it's, at least that's my, that's my takeaway. You know what I mean? So he's, he is doing the thing that the King's guard should do is basically be like, Oh, there's going to be this big, like blowout fight. Like I'm out. Y'all let me know when it's decided and I'll come back to being a King's guard. And you also uh, got to remember it, Lord Westerling was Rhaenyra's like personal King's guard. Yeah. To start out yeah, episode now, one. Yeah. Now that, that doesn't mean that, that, Sir Sir Westerling here isn't going to defect or help out the blacks, but but um but I think that's why they let him leave is because they trust that he is just doing the job of a king's guard, which is to serve the king. And right now there isn't one. Yeah, I do I do agree with that. The second he walked out, I jotted down, I think Kristen Cole just became Lord Commander. Um <laughs> obviously that ends up becoming correct. Allison wants to install him. But man, what what a series of events here to open up the episode just to first of all like you said, pretty cool to just go straight into where we where we closed out episode 8 to start right there with episode 9 um to immediately see how the greens, the green faction of of Otto Hightower and Allison Hightower are going to proceed from here and uh, have a member of the small council murdered. I mean, things start off in this episode pretty 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 good. Today's episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. After years of fine print contracts and getting ripped off by big wireless providers, if we've learned anything, it's that there's always a catch. So when I first heard that Mint Mobile offers premium wireless starting at just 15 bucks a month, I thought, what's the catch? But after talking with them and using their service, it all made sense. There isn't one. Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they're the first company to sell wireless online only. They cut out the cost of retail stores and pass those sweet savings directly to you. Most of us stay looking for ways to cut costs and stack cash, and Mint Mobile is here to help you do just that while providing high quality service online so you don't have to roll into some horribly run authorized wireless retailer trap. For anyone who hates their phone bill, Mint Mobile offers a premium wireless service for just 15 bucks a month. Mint Mobile gives you the best rate whether you're buying for one or a family and at Mint, families start at two lines. All plans come with unlimited talk and text, high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts. Switch to Mint Mobile and get premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. Clam fam to get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get that plan shipped to your door for free. Go to mintmobile.com slash dragon. That's mintmobile.com slash dragon to cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash dragon dragon so allison goes straight from this council meeting to look for Aegon. he's not in his rooms though and they can't find him uh so by the way just a moment here when 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 allison is looking for him and goes in i think it's like helena's chambers maybe helena yep. grabs allison and says what she said last week there yep. is a beast beneath the boards that's right so we've heard that before it's mentioned again still no clue what it means and still would compare it to the Ozark three symbols at the beginning of the episode thing. You can't tell. Yeah. And also just a, you know, a nice reference to the very famous Rolling Stones album, Beast Beneath the Boards. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would note, this is the first scene where I kind of remembered like, so Aegon walks in and is overlooking like his mom talking to Helena, trying to figure out where, or I'm, I'm sorry, Amond, Amond walks in yes. and it's, they're trying to figure out where Aegon is. And it occurred to me like he's kind of disgusted with the behavior of his is it's it's his brother, right? Oh yeah. His older brother. Yes. Yeah. So that obviously plays out well the rest of the episode. Um Otto sends Sir Eric and Sir Eric. That's right. Yeah, Eric and Eric. Eric and Eric. E R R E Y K and A R R Y K. <laughs> Yeah, if you, Miguel uh, Sapochnik in the in the inside the episode was like doing you know kind of a good job of of saying Eric and Arik so that you kind of you could kind of distinguish, but then when they went to Ryan Condal, he was just like it's uh, he was just saying Eric and Eric. So. Eric and Eric. <laughs> <laughs> which which one of the Erics is it that st that watches his brother fight and doesn't go and help him? I believe that's Eric with an E. If I if I'm remembering correctly, from, see, I thought from it was Eric with an episode. A. Yeah, it it doesn't matter. One of the Erics is <laughs> is is not happy with with what's going on. He does not want Aegon to be installed as king, and he he's kind of defecting a little bit. And he's 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 gonna go help out our 
our girl uh, Renice here in a minute. But yeah, uh, Eric and Eric, they're they're on the they're on the mission. Renice is going to need help because she's locked in her chambers. And uh, this is the point in the episode where I noted that the music was extremely foreboding and building in a way that is very familiar on Thrones. They like to do uh-huh. this, and it was it was heavy yeah i mean and and you know we can speak a little generally about the episode i i thought that this episode ends up being mostly set up right like it's it's it is it's almost more of a true penultimate episode game of thrones you know and and the sopranos before it um really kind of like taught hbo watchers especially to like kind of expect you know the massive fireworks or 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 the heads rolling literally to kind of occur in the penultimate episode and then and then the the finale is usually like the the mop up the dust up and the setup for the the following season but it seems like if we get any any major deaths or any major plot twists or any major reveals you know etc it's going to be next week and i'm sure that there will be set up for season 2 as well next week but but it seems like the 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 giant things are are going to be in a finale which is uh which i'm i'm personally okay with it's just it, I, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I kind of went into this episode expecting gi- gigantic movement. And while it was all really, really cool and fun, and um, and 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 obviously, like you're saying, they do a great job of building tension. In the end, it's pretty, it's pretty low key, all things considered, until the very, very final scene. I agree um, with you, and I, I think it's interesting because Sapochnik and Condal in the inside of the episode even noted that they were looking for a penultimate moment, and that that's right. why they came up with Renice's dragon coming up through the the floorboard of this mm-hmm. of this meeting, of yep. this uh, uh, ascension ceremony. And other than that moment, it is all set up, right? It is yep. all. It is not. It is not the episode I expected. It is not this huge, you know, oh my god moment. Now, it was still cool, but I found it interesting that even though it was clearly a setup episode, they couldn't help themselves but to try to force in something that would stand out as the penultimate memory. Right, right, right yeah. And it did in a way, and we'll get to it, but it was, I, I completely agree with you, Barrett. This did feel like a lot more setup than maybe a lot of us were expecting. And, and that kind of, honestly, now that we're done with it, makes me happy because I feel like we have more to look forward to next week than sure. perhaps I otherwise would have expected. Um, but yes, to your, like, Renice is locked in her chambers, and from there we see, like, there are a lot of people getting locked up here. Laris is overlooking, yes. overseeing, and I, it just seems like anybody who might be an obvious Rhaenyra ally, or anybody that might obviously leak intel to her, is being... Or, or, or to the White Worm, right? Right. So, Kristen Cole updates Alicent on what's happening with the Aegon search, and... Amon volunteers to go with Kristen Cole to look for Aegon. So this is where we get the Amon Kristen Cole pairing. And we find out <laughs> in this little side conversation that Aegon took Amon to the Street of Silk on his 13th name day. And this is when they start to get like, we already know this guy's a sexual deviant and a problem and a, and a criminal and is committing assault on a semi regular basis. But now they're talking about like some deeper, darker pr- proclivities that come out over the course of this. We really don't ever get the specifics, but he's down there watching kid fights. He's down there looking for, for whatever kind of weird shit he can get his hands on, I guess. Um, so they're going around questioning people, the madams and such, right? But these two, as they admit, are not really the kind of dudes who are going to be able to find him because they're not down and dirty, you know, brothel yeah. boys. Yeah, and, and and two notes here. One is that Kristen fully committed to the bit now with the uh, um, you know, acting like he doesn't know what Eamon is talking about. Um and he has to lay it out for him when he says it's time to get it wet, I believe, or maybe I'm paraphrasing there. Uh and then Eamon, um, you know, the the madam recognizes him, right? Uh and and so I, it says, My how you've grown. So I think I, I'm not sure exactly how you were supposed to read that, but you could read that as one, he used to frequent this, the street of silk, or maybe it's that he never did. He came that once and that was it. So he really is more of a, you know, has more of a moral compass maybe than, uh, than his brother does. And if nothing else, it speaks to that woman's memory. My God. Yeah. Because I think <laughs> to me, the, the takeaway was that that, 
just this was the, it just happened to be the brothel that he had just told us that his brother yeah. took him to. I think that's the right interpretation. Yeah. And mm-hmm. this lady remembers him. Um, I mean, he, he is a silver haired prince with an eye patch. So, you know, probably pretty, pretty memorable there. And you got to remember, he got the eye patch very early on. That's right. Was a young boy there. So Otto tells the bannermen in the throne room that they have to pledge their banners to the future king uh, and, and that they're not leaving the throne room without declaring their intentions. And some old man, I'm not sure who this guy was, but he's like, I'm not an oath, oath breaker. I will not bend the knee. And Otto yeah, asks, but, do you know who this was? No, but it doesn't matter because he's dead now. Um, the the thing about it, it he, look, what, what's up with all this like faux, you know, nobility and, and valiance in these, in these Westerosi medieval times, right? Like just drop to the knee ASAP you got to play your cards right here. You you get on that knee and and you you know you swear your fealty up and down as many times as they need you to do it, but you but get out of the castle, man. You then guess to, what you can then guess what you can do? Go to Dragonstone anyway. Live to fight another day. What the hell's wrong with this guy? Yeah, it's, I do. Ex- exactly. What 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 are these people doing just be like, uh, no, I'm going to I'm going to go out nobly and just die right here without being able to help my cause. So Otto goes Anybody else's fingers hurt? And this other lady volunteers. She's like, yeah, uh, <laughs> House Fell also keeps its sworn oath to the princess. So they're both escorted out. Yeah, well, what, what, what is happening here? They're just like, yeah, I guess I'll die now. I'll volunteer for death. And then yeah. there's a, a very sad uh, long live the king that Otto leads where he's like, long live the king. And then everybody goes, long live the king. And yeah. uh, from there... We are back to oh, Laris overlooks that entire thing. He just oversees everything in this entire. He's in the he's in the corner, mm-hmm. the dark corner, creeping yeah, this entire yeah, episode. Yeah, th- th- this man he he's not going to miss any chance he get. You know he can get to maybe just see a pair of of uh of naked feet, and you never know when those moments will arise, Ross. That's very true, Barrett. Back to the search for Aegon, where we see the kids fight in Flea Bottom, which apparently Aegon frequents. Um, okay, let's just what. Let's what? talk. Let, we got to talk about the boy fights here, man. The boy fights. <laughs> it, what is happening? Is this a real thing? Is this is this pulled from 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 medieval lore? I don't know. I mean, we've they heard just, of they they sharpened the peasant the peasant ch- children's nails and gr- ground down their teeth to make them just you know killers in the pit. Yeah, are their teeth being sharpened? Is yes. that what's happening? Yes. <laughs> Man, I don't I just don't know how you recover from being a boy that's in the boy fights. Like it, what the career path like, the, you know, what's your career trajectory after you graduate from the boy fights? My guess is that no, but nobody like makes it out of the boy fights. It's you know, it's one of those things where you're it's kind of like being in the UFC. Like yeah. nobody ever stays champion for that long. You always in, inevitably get your ass kicked by by the the, the next up and comer. Uh, that, that's kind of how I envisioned the, the boy fight scene happening down there in Flea Bottom. So you don't but think it, it's like Gladiator where like a Marcus Aurelius or like not Marcus Aurelius, but uh, Maximus can rise up through the Gladiator ranks and become king one day. You don't think one of the boy fights kids no, graduates I mean, well, so to I, be king? I think no, I think what happens is that if you do somehow some way make it out, uh, that means you get to go uh, onto Carnival Row and perhaps lend your services as a fire hands guy. Dude, this did kind of make me think about <laughs> what, what was that recent movie with Bradley Cooper where he worked in a. Oh, yeah, uh, it was the the Guillermo del Toro one. A min- midnight. No. Midnight Alley. Yeah. Yeah. Nightmare Alley. Nightmare Alley. Nightmare Alley. That movie was creepy and it made me think about that. The boy fights did. Um, but. Yeah, and then the, so they they nod over to the to the cage where there's another boy waiting for his his turn to fight, and he clearly has like long blonde Valyrian Targaryen hair, and they they allude to the fact that that's one of many that that old Aegon here has sired, one of many many bastards, and to get rid of these bastards, he's just he's just putting them right into the you know to the to the boy fight pipeline, the boy fight fi- uh, pits, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this guy, I mean, not only a rapist, but also just like subjecting his own children to um to boy death fights and, to death and deformation via boy fights. So and then he's attending the boy fights. That's he's the going thing. To the, he's he's going to the boy fights. Yeah. He's he's where down his there with boys the, are fighting. Oh. 
That's right. And uh, by the way, shame on like the 500 people there cheering on and betting on the boy fights. Just absolute depravity happening down there in Flea Bottom. It is inhumane. And it's the result of, I believe, <laughs> Damon and all of the uh, city watch exiting the city. Um, <laughs> but yeah, man, this kid, look, they, they spend all this time beating around the bush on like what it is or isn't that, that Egg and Aegon does down there in Flea Bottom and, and what all he gets into. And the two Eric's end up sort of being the ones that do that the most. Where I'm like, just say it. What is it that he's doing down here? And then they finally give us a little bit here where he's like, look over there in the pit. Yeah. And this just freaking silver haired kid. Like they wouldn't even <laughs> shave his head. Wouldn't everybody there be like, hey, what's with hey. this one boy in the boy fights who looks like a Targaryen boy? Yeah. yeah. Shouldn't we tell someone about that? Like the white worm wouldn't know about this shit. I mean, that's the thing. I think that's the takeaway. Everybody knows. Right. Everybody, yes. he's not doing anything to hide it. He's got kids down here fighting in the boy fights that he shows up and watches. The dude is a completely unhinged lunatic, and he's installed as king at the end of the episode. Um, so from there, Amon tells Cole, as they're going about walking, talking, looking for Aegon together, Amon, one eye, tells Kristen Cole, look, I'm better at everything, and I try at all the stuff you're supposed to try at to be king, it should be me. I should be that guy. And you're kind of yeah. like, oh, look, here's more of those in, more cracks in fighting, more in fighting. He, he 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 even says that he has the biggest dragon, which is is what I what after that funeral episode. That's what I said. I was like, having the biggest dragon that is gonna make that's gonna make you a little cocky. You know what I mean? Absolutely. You're gonna, that's it. How, how could it not? So, um, but yes, he. L let me get your let me get your temperature on Amon's one eye. Yeah, good good guy or bad guy? I think that's he's very Damon-y at the moment. Yeah. Where I'm like, all right, this dude's pretty sick. He does he 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 seems tight. He hasn't done anything flagrantly, you know, disgusting right. yet for like, me to be appalled he's, by he's, him. He's he's on the greens, and I think a smaller percentage of the audience is uh, is aligning with that side at at, at the current stage. But like. You know he's he's not wrong. He 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 practices his skills. You know he goes to all of his piano lessons and does not complain about them. That's right. Uh, and and he 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 would probably be a lot better leader than um than old than old Aegon up there. But uh but yeah. So one of the Eriks is talking about how they got to do something about Aegon. He's not fit to rule. The other one pushes back, and then some chick comes up and says she can tell them where Aegon is for a price. And this chick ends up being one of the white worms, little birds. Mm -hmm. Then we've got one guy trying to flee King's Landing. But when they stop him and capture him, they're like, you were going to warn Rhaenyra, you traitorous bastard. And he's like, <laughs> no, I've got no love for the queen. But I was fleeing, but I won't tell you why. It was just yeah, really weird. Yeah. yeah, again, again, uh, once you hesitate to drop the knee, D don't try to leave like 10 minutes later. Like you got to hang around, you know, shoot the shit, maybe have a cup of, uh, of, of, of Dornish red with some of the greens, just really, really, really bask in it all. And just be like, <laughs> man, can't believe I almost sided with Rainier. What an, what a dope I was. And then just casually go about, get about your way. Maybe the next day, you know, stay a night. Yeah. Fake it till you make it. This guy ends up getting hung because he didn't hang around and fake it. Yeah. Laris and Otto then have a meeting, which is a really interesting one. Laris basically took Otto says, look, you spend a lot of time with my daughter. And Laris says, hey, man, there's no reason that time invested can't also benefit you, big guy, you directly. Yeah, yeah La Laris with this scene officially are, I think, our most little fingerish. I know that there's been a lot of comparisons um, early on with Otto to Littlefinger. But th this whole just like I'm literally going to play every single side, you know, is is that that's little finger to a T, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Today's episode is also brought to you by Calm.com. Back in 2020, I got into meditation for the first time, and it was definitely something I kind of judged as weird before I tried it. And holy crap, has it changed my ability to stay centered and calm throughout the course of my stressful life. So if meditating was one of your things you intended to get into more regularly this year and maybe it didn't go well... Whether you're crushing your goals or you need a little boost, Calm can help. With Calm, you can jumpstart or continue your meditation practice and find peace of mind today. We are partnering with Calm, the number one mental wellness app, to give you the tools 
that improve the way you feel, reduce stress and anxiety through guided meditations, improve focus with curated music tracks, and rest and recharge with Calm's imaginative sleep stories for children and adults. There's even new daily movement sessions designed to relax your body and uplift your mind. If you go to calm.com slash dragon, you'll get a special offer for 40% off a Calm premium subscription. And new content is added every week. Over 100 million people around the world use Calm to take care of their minds. Calm is ready to help you stress less, sleep more, and live happier and healthier. For listeners of our show, Calm is offering an exclusive offer of 40% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash dragon. You just go to calm.com slash dragon for 40% off unlimited access to Calm's entire library. That's calm.com slash dragon. Dragon, dragon, dragon. So we see these weirdos with the boards behind their heads tending to Viserys' corpse, and Alicent picks up the crown and places it on his stomach, and then she weeps for him. And Barrett, I thought this was a, 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 a genuine moment of mourning from Alicent. Um, mm-hmm. What was your read here? I, I think mine was that she really loved him, but was also so caught up in this game, maybe, that she, you know, that the game sort of overrode any, any real love she did have. Yeah, I, I, I think, um, well, I, I sort of agree. I do, I do think that she loved him. I, I think that this is a real moment of mourning, like you said. Uh, I, I think it's just, yeah, I mean, this is, it's just been a lot, right? This, this was her, we'll get, we'll get to a little bit more of Allison as a person and as a character here, um, in the next couple of scenes. But like, I thought this one was just kind of telling that, like, you know, for the for all of her young adult and 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 adult life, she's basically served this guy, right? Right. And so that that's just it's that's uh and that's it's a complicated gone. moment. It's a complicated moment. I think that you know the fact that he's gone, it does. It's also a moment where she realizes that she kind of has to take these next steps in the game. You know, he he was not only like the glue holding the family together, like we talked about last week, but also you know, the buffer between her actually having to make decisions like whether or not she should kill her childhood best friend. Absolutely. Alicent visits Renice, who, again, has been locked up in her chambers, and she apologizes for the lack of ceremony, tells her the king is dead, to which immediately responds, uh, Renice, and you're usurping the throne. And Alicent appeals to Renice to support her and tells her she should have been queen, that the Iron Throne was hers by blood and by temperament, uh, that we we do not rule, but we may guide the men that do, and then promises her drift mark to pass on as she, as she sees fit within her family, um, if she'll come along on her side. Renice responds, "You are wiser than I believed you to be, Alice and Hightower, and yet you toil still in service to men. Your father, your husband, your son. Have you ever imagined yourself on the Iron Throne?" And this is that big trailer moment that we've been waiting for right where somebody gets Allison for the first time to maybe question if if she should be installed um but so what was your read here because obviously she doesn't really take that message and run with it she still installs her son Aegon by the end of the episode what was your read what was Renice trying to do I'm, I mean I think that I, I don't think that there was going to be any like shifting the momentum just by one casual reference to like, haven't you ever thought about it? But I still think there's a possibility that that planted some sort of seed that, that, that could grow and blossom at a, at a later date in in some way, shape or form. How I'm not really sure yet, but it, it, but it, 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 it what it does do in, in service of this episode is come back to the thing that we were talking about between Allison and Otto. You know, she it, it it is a it is recognition. Thank thanks to Renice, what she says here, it's recognition by Allison that that yes, she all she has done is served these men, right? Um, but especially Otto. This is, I think, a moment of realization that like her entire life has been manufactured, uh, and she's just been moved around like a pawn by by her own father, um, and and so then you know just. It, it, it's a continuation of 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 how she was groomed like that that she is you know we'll, we'll see here in and in, in in i think potentially one of the very next scenes but like she's still being used by men even though she is trying to like as she says kind of like uh what how does she phrase it what does she say that they get that she can that they can persuade them to peace or something like that they can yeah that they, they may guide them 
guide them. Yeah. So, so e- even though she thinks she may be guiding all of these men at the end of the day, she, she's still a pawn for all of them. Yeah. So Renice really ends up, I mean, sowing dissent within the yeah. green ranks here on the way out the door, obviously, um, by propositioning Allison with that idea, because I think you're exactly right. It's the thing that kicks her off to standing up to her dad and saying, look, I'm the one who found Aemon, or Aegon, excuse me, and yep. my people got him, and now we're going to do what I want to do for the rest of the way. We're going to start playing by my rules, by my playbook. And it's interest- It's just interesting. Renice is a very interesting character. She makes a lot of decisions that kind of make you go, hmm, one of which yeah. obviously comes at the end of the episode that we'll get to. I also thought that this was... Uh... I don't know exactly what this means yet. I, I need a little bit more time to 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 kind of percolate on it, and maybe we'll get a, a good phone call on Patreon about it or something. But this is like the eighth time. Maybe I'm exaggerating here, but at, at least the, the there have been several moments where somebody walks into a room and basically tells Renice that she should have been queen, right? Like that. Like people love to bring that up. People love to tell her that. Like. Oh, you know what? We all know it really should have been you, right? Like, and I don't know if that's, I, I don't know if it's people just tr- immediately trying to get Renice kind of trying to d- disarm her and get her, her onto their side. So if it's kind of this patronizing thing to just say, because everybody knew that it would never happen anyway, or if it's, or if it's deeper than that, if it's, if it's kind of subtly saying that, that, that this idea that a woman can't ascend the Iron Throne you know, everybody loves to say that'll never happen. It can never happen. It's really not true. It's just that people keep saying it. But but the truth is that a lot of people would accept that, would would push for that, or would believe that that a woman was um was in her rightful place to ascend the throne. I'm not sure yet, but it's. It, I just I noted that I was like, how many times have we heard this? Well, the funny thing about Renice is that she is the. F- one person who seems to fully believe that there was never any chance that she was going right. to be queen. <laughs> yes. And that right, she wishes exactly. people would just move on from it. Right. Like, <laughs> so, cause yeah. you always kind of think maybe this will spur her to be one of the players in the game that's fighting for the iron throne, but she never really takes it that way. And also to no. your point, I do think it's that it, it is the obvious suck up move to bring up to this woman. So everyone kind of does that her, her own husband included to try to, gain favor in a conversation. And in this case, it's obviously very powerful because it's Alicent, the king's wife, uh, the late king's wife, who's telling her this and basically admitting, look, you would have been better. You would have been better. Everybody knows Viserys, the peaceful, was just kind of a soft, you know, goon up there. You right. would have been better. It should have been you. Join my team for the love of God. I need you. Um, and then she tells her... Uh, I'll leave you with your thoughts. Ring the bell when you have an answer. So she still locks her in there and makes her ring the bell. Yes, yes. So uh, Amond and Otto see the white worm, or I'm sorry, Amond and uh, Kristen Cole see the white worm meeting with Otto, who has never met the white worm before. This is their their first meeting, Otto and the white worm face to face. He has her paid, and she tells him that she has safely tucked the prince Aemon, or Aegon away. Uh, she says... In exchange for telling them where Aegon is, she wants an end to the savage use of children in Flea Bottom. So immediately, we've got the white worm on the counter trying to put an end to the boy fights. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I've always said that the the best way to end, um, you know, the boy fights is by uh, installing the guy that is kind of running and contributing kids to the boy fights. Install that guy as king. That's how you get rid of him. I agree. Um, is it just me or is the white worm talking differently? <laughs> Does she have like a different accent every episode? Is that part of her character? Uh, th- this is the one that I think she has been trying to lock in on since this, the, since her second appearance. Now it's slightly dialed back from when she's on Dragonstone. Okay. But you think she's finally got it here? No, I don't think she has it at all. I think every time she sits down on set, she's like, Oh my God, I hope I can get it this time. Um, oh, that's but, been my uh, read too. She does not seem comfortable with this voice. I don't think she's comfortable with this accent. Uh, it's, 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 it's fine. It is what it is. It, it, she's, she's not on screen enough for me to like, let it bother me, but it is like, it does. It, 
it does like the the only you know dark spot is like the casting director is batting ninety eight percent instead of a hundred percent. You know what I mean? I know what you mean. So the so. white worm says, "Remember when your plot's ripen and you install your grandson on the throne? Remember it was me who put him there." And then basically says, "I could have killed him; he would have been gone, but I didn't." Otto says he will remember. So then the Eric's Eric and Eric discover Amond under some altar. And he tries yeah, to, yeah. like, he's like drug, he's either on drugs or drunk or both still. And he tries to run, but they end up catching him and they're escorting him out. But Cole and Amond pop up. They, they intercept, yeah. And they meet them with swords. Now, at this point in the episode, I hadn't really pieced it together as it was, as it was happening live. Like, well, these people all want different things. One of them is working for Allison. One of them is working for Otto. And that those are not, in fact, the same team anymore. That they're split, especially in this instance where they want, you know, Otto clearly was going to take Amond and then use him having him to have power over Alicent and what they did next is what it seems like. Yeah, um, I, I thought that the oh, got a little bit of feedback there. Sorry about that. Um, I, I thought that the the game of these two, like, you know, buddy cop duos, as we like to say, were, were kind of both hunting for for Aegon here. I thought that that was like a fun conceit on this episode. Yeah. But I'm, to I'm totally with you. Like I wasn't, I kept thinking to myself, okay, what, why is it so important that each of them get this guy first? Like th they're both going to see him at some point. It's not like he's immediately going to go be able to fly up to Dragonstone and kill Rhaenyra and Damon. Like they're, but right. Uh, Otto is standing right up there when he's, when he ascends the throne, like Allison is sitting with him in the carriage. So it's like, the, this idea that they absolutely like it, you know, it was the end, the fate of the realm, as Alicent says, depends on her getting to Aegon first. Seemed a little, just I don't, I don't know, far fetched maybe, but like, it, it just seemed like it was. Um, I, I wasn't totally grasping that throughout this this hunt, and it seemed like one of the it. it Maybe, my guess is that maybe the Eric's weren't all the way 100% sure they were going to do what they were supposed to do with him yet. Yeah. Because one of them says something like, we're going to take you to somebody outside the city gates or something like that. Anyway, it just, yeah, it was a little bit confusing. One of the twins ends up abandoning the other while they fight. One of the Eric's is not down with the other Eric. Definitely thought Kristen was going to murder the one Eric, though, in the, in the sword fight. Pretty surprised he didn't. Yep. And uh, so, yeah, they end up taking Amund to Alicent. Alicent and Otto meet, and she tells him this is when she ends up, you know, taking what Renice said and basically using it as fuel to stand up to her dad. Look, like you've just used me as a piece that you moved about the board. Um, she's, he says, look, you got whatever you wanted. Basically, he says, I wanted whatever you impressed upon me to want. And then Alicent says she'll basically, look, we're going to proceed as I see fit now. Kristen Cole is going to be Lord Commander. Aegon will ascend the throne tomorrow and take Blackfire, the Conqueror's sword and name. Aegon the Conqueror is going to be his king name. And Alicent uh, says Rhaenyra is going to be spared. She's going to be sent somewhere and she can never come back. And he's yeah. like, well, what if she does come back? He's like, she won't. She's like, she, he, she won't. She can't, yeah. Or we, we, yeah, she can't return, or we can't let her return. So yeah, something, something like that. Um, I, I want to re. Can I rewind real quick? Just, to, yeah, just yeah. To, just a second. One, I just wanted to say, I, I think that the deal that the white worm struck was a terrible deal. Yeah. That One day, she, remember she, this. Yeah, she got Otto's word that he would quote look into the boy fights, and then she was like, "Remember that I gave you Aegon," and he was like, "Okay, I'll remember." I mean, it seems like the biggest right. possible chip you could cash in ever. Hey, I have the the king. Yeah. And yes, to your point, you got like a bag of silver and like a false promise. So I don't know that 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 stuck out to me. Bad deal by the white worm. And, and as then, a schemer, I, she should know. Like, you don't trust another schemer's word just off of that. Not. Like, come on. No. Uh, so then I, I wanted to touch on Aegon here because. When we find him and he gets dragged out by by the Eric's and then he gets, um, you know, snared by by Kristen Cole and Amond, he's this like pitiful scene of a guy, right? His, you know, he's he's bleary eyed and he's drunk and he's sad and he's crying and he's talking about how he doesn't want to be on the throne and he's not suited for it and he's like, 
he's just, he's kind of this pathetic, sad sack. Right. And so I, 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 this is, this is one other thing that I just want to call out character wise, um, that, that I'm, you know, we, we, we get a kind of, we get a kind of personality or mood shift from him at the end, but I'm not totally finding it like jive perfectly that this guy is like a serial rapist slash boy fighter. And then like, this is his kind of attitude, like about being found. And do you know what I mean? No. Cause I mean, to me, it was uh, the, ironically, it was almost Dahmer esque, like, like Dahmer, Jeffrey Dahmer is like this sad drunken <laughs> loser of a huh. man. Right. And, and th- I think that's sort of like, this guy's just a piece of shit. Like he, he did never, give me, he never the, got the, the, p- the parenting he needed or the guidance he needed. This guy's trash. He makes nothing but terrible decisions. And he's just a turd out there, Barrett. He doesn't have any will to be king or do really anything meaningful with his life. He just wants to go watch the boy fights and commit it, yeah, sex crimes. It, it did. It did make me think of like that. That's that's. I mean, Dahmer. I, I I guess could be classified as this. I'm I'm not totally sure. I haven't done all the research or watched the Netflix series. But like when I was trying to think of, you know, kind of sociopaths or or, or psychos or criminals out there that can do like this kind of insane violence, but then are also this like really like soft kind of, you know, just pathetic personality. I thought about like, you know, pedophiles basically. Yeah. But Jeffrey right? Dahmer, like, like I just watched that Netflix show and that's very much, <clears throat> I'm not saying that's <laughs> exactly how he acted, but pretty much any portrayal of him, any, any rendition of him you've seen on screen, he is always sort of this drunken loner loser. Yeah. And then he was off doing these horrifying things. So it, it's not, it doesn't, I feel you. It's not traditional. It's not what I would have expected Amon's or Aegon's character to be, considering yeah, just kind of, you, how much of a monster kind of ex- he's being made out to be. Right. You kind of expect more of like a Ramsay or a Joffrey, right? For like sure. S- somebody kind of ferocious and 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 brutal, brutalist to be out here, you know, raping handmaids and and um and sending their bastard children into the boy fights. So it does give uh, yeah, him a like, little bit of an interesting angle though. It makes him a little bit more of this, like, you know, a, a little bit more of that modern Joker esque villain where he's, he's like a sad boy underneath it all. Yeah. And then now he's being empowered. It was almost like the end of Joker when he gets crowned. And when they finally do roar at the end of this episode, it's like the end of Joker when he's standing on the cop car and right. there's all this chaos breaking out around him and all these people coming up to him. Like, I mean, I, I just think it gives him a different angle to play with than those two guys you just named, where Joffrey and Ramsay were kind of this more traditional machismo villain. villain. Now yeah. this is the sad boy king we've got here. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, sorry, she, to, sorry to interrupt. After Allison and Otto meet, that's where we were. Yeah, so before she leaves the room, Otto says, you look so much like your mother in certain lights, and then she walks out and he says, as you wish in terms of her uh, yep. wishes. So Laris is waiting for Alicent in her chambers and mm-hmm. said, what's up? I said, uh-huh, uh-huh, yep, yep. And asks her if she's wondered how it is that her father, the Hand, found Aegon first. Now, I wasn't really sure what that question meant. Do you have yeah, any he, idea? Yeah, he he was, he he did something that fed them the right information or a, or somewhere along the lane uh, along the way the the, tr- the trail of information he put auto ahead basically now why would he do uh, so he was basically just telling her look you don't have me like solidified on your team your team i'm gonna need to see those feet yes basically he was like yeah yep it was another bargaining chip play for him where he was like hey look i can work for your dad as well um and, and you oh know, you I, know what and it's a callback to that scene from earlier where Otto and where is yeah, where Laris and him meet, and he says this information I get from her, this time I spend with her, could easily benefit you as well. Yep. So I guess he's saying, look, I could switch teams on you now, or you could show me your feet, and I could masturbate to them. That's right. where and, you're at, and, Allison. And if you would, if you would like me to go through, follow through with um, removing all of these little birds and spies, and then uh, killing the white worm. All you got to do is is bear those beauties, put them up on the couch right there, and let me rub one out real quick. So he stares at her feet and tells her there's a web of spies in the Red Keep and that Otto has left it in place to his benefit, basically, and that he's never told her about it. And that's part of the way he gets all his information and runs his game. She takes off her socks 
And then he tells her that one of the little spiders that is in this web of spies that Otto has control of is her lady in waiting and that they have to take out the white worm. Yeah. Yeah. If, if, if Allison, you know, what Renice says to her is that she doesn't actually want to be free. She just wants to um, create a window in her prison cell. Great line, by the way. Uh, very, very meaningful and impactful. I thought it was a great description. Um, but if she ever does want to break out of that prison cell, she, she's she got great prospects. She can move straight across the narrow sea over to Pentos or Essos, and she can be the fount. She can start the very first OnlyFans for foot fetishes. <laughs> So he cranks to her feet. Um, it, look, clearly the foot fetish has to do with his own foot situation, right? You gotta, you gotta think so, yeah. And this is also officially Quentin Tarantino's favorite TV show. Today's episode is also brought to you by NetSuite 2000, 2008, 2022. When it comes to the economy, those are some scary years. Dot-com crash, housing crash, and the roller coaster we're going through right now. One thing is certain... It's a dangerous time not to know your numbers, but over 31,000 businesses have the confidence and clarity they need because they rely on NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud financial system. NetSuite gives you the visibility and control of your financials, inventory, HR planning, and budgeting that you need so you can manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need all in one place. So how do you prepare for uncertain times? The answer is NetSuite. NetSuite helps you identify rising costs, automate your business processes, and easily see where to save money. That's why 93% of customers say they improve their visibility and control when they upgraded to NetSuite. What are you waiting for? Right now, NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind flexible financing program. Head to NetSuite.com slash dragon right now to check it out. That's NetSuite.com slash dragon. One more time, NetSuite dot com slash dragon so some dude comes and sneaks princess rainice out it's it's one of the king's guard he abandons it's, his it's, post yeah it's one it's one of the erics oh it is? oh it's the other eric yeah okay uh, i'm not sure which one the other one is but it is the other eric it's and the other eric. they see that dude that got hung um that they, we, they caught trying to leave king's landing earlier on their way out we see us there's a random shot here of a mysterious figure burned, like walking away from that burned out building that's on fire. Is yeah. that meant to be the white worms headquarters? That was my read that, that, that I took away that that was one of Laris's beetles, um, burning down setting, her place, setting fire to her place. Um, which I'm, obviously now, doesn't I, mean she's dead. It does not. And I'm, I'm quite sure that she is not in fact, yeah, and I, I have to imagine that this probably pushes her back towards Team Damon and their complicated relationship has some uh, further blossoming. It, it, it might. And I'm also just, I think it's an interesting wrinkle, something that we've not seen uh, yet. But I, I like the idea of kind of like a little finger versus a little finger fight. Love that. You know what I mean? Like yeah. A, like a, oh, yeah. Like a, bat, a battle of the spy networks. Um, I think that's like kind of cool, something that they could really play with uh, over the next next season it reminds me of Varys and Littlefinger a little bit how they were right, sort of right. in the same game and on the same level and same skill level you know what I mean yeah yeah but we I, I you know I, and I think they they had their conflicts here and there but they never were like kind of like directly going after one another absolutely I don't, I don't, yeah so the, this the, this is something that could be could be different could be unique that the show can play with so this is where the the build toward the end of the episode begins, where we're going through this massive crowd with Renice, and she gets separated from her Eric, which is kind of a weird element of this this final this whole ending to this episode. Like the fact that she does go it alone, I, I wasn't sure why it mattered that she got separated from him, but I guess it was just supposed to mm -hmm. give us more fear and anxiety around what might happen to her. Yeah. So everybody's headed to the Ascension, obviously. That's why I kept being like, why are there so many people? Is she being set up? Is this some kind of crazy, like, what the hell is happening? Why are there so many cops everywhere? Um, Allison and Aegon are riding to his Ascension ceremony in their little trailer, and Aegon insists Viserys didn't want him to be king. So he's kind of like almost, you know, in on the, the whole gig is, jig is up sort of thing. Like he... He sees through it. He sees that yep. his mom wants to install him. He does not believe that the late king actually used his last words to say that he should be king. Allison gives him the cat's paw dagger and says with his final breath uh, that Viserys wished for him to be king. And it just kind of, it, it shows you the peril here because we've spent this time over the course of this season talking about Aegon's dream. 
Aegon the Conqueror's Dream, A Song of Ice and Fire, What It Means, The Targaryen Legacy, Needing to Pass It Down to Rhaenyra, Only Heirs Getting This Information. And now Alicent has this muddled-ass version of it and is giving the cat's paw dagger to her rapist psycho kid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> With no idea how to, to, to see the, the poem in there, right? Right. No like idea. She doesn't, she, she doesn't know to, how to heat that thing up. No, she doesn't. <laughs> she tells Aegon not to kill Al uh, not to kill Rhaenyra, not to listen to her dad, Otto. And Aegon's response is, do you love me? And then she calls him an imbecile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, yeah. Great relationship they've got going. Weird, weird, weird exchange there. So then we're at this very public ascension where I, I think people are being forced to go to this, oh, yeah. was my read. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so every all the peasants in Flea Bottom are being, uh, bottom are being pushed <laughs> toward this thing and forced to go witness it because they need everybody to see it. And that creates a very interesting element in the crowd, especially at the beginning of the ceremony where Otto announces Viserys the Peaceful is dead. Nobody in the crowd really reacts much at all, which I think says something about Viserys' legacy on some level. And he says that Viserys' last wishes were that Aegon, his, own, his oldest son, become king. And some people clap here. So there's some people in the crowd who are stoked enough on the, like, no woman thing. Yeah. That they're yeah. like, all right, yeah, no, that makes sense. That guy, he's got a dick, for <laughs> sure, absolutely. Yes, clapping, all right, clapping, positivity. But then we go back to kind of awkward, because Aegon is, he comes out to trumpets and is walked down this path of, you know, cross swords or whatever, gets mm. up on the stage. It's just crickets, man. Like, just no energy in this building at all, and you can't really tell what anybody is thinking. Um, Renice like sneaks out the side as the ceremony gets going, and I kind of just assumed she was gone for the episode. They put the crown of the Conqueror. It's a different crown than Viserys Targaryen War. It's the crown of the Conqueror, Barrett. It's the crown of the Conqueror. Been passed down through the generations, and they put it on his head, and they say, "Let the seven uh, uh, witness Aegon Targaryen is the true heir to the Iron Throne." And there's like some grumbling in the crowd. They're like, oh God, they're bringing in the religious shit again. And But then they announce him in full. They say second of his name, you know, the whole spiel. Yeah. And after a few seconds of awkwardness, the crowd roars. Yeah, they get, they get into it. And they really get into it. And I wasn't sure what gave them that that reaction like what finally get like it was like did they finally get the please clap sign to work in the back or the applause <laughs> sign working in the background but they really get into it and that's when Aegon for the first time starts to see the positive side of being king totally it's the love and the attention and the adoration and so he turns to the crowd and raises his arms up he unsheathes his sword whatever it's black fire it's pretty sick by the way and uh holds him oh, the, the, it's it's not a good thing not as viewers who are aware of what this young man is capable of, this is a bad moment for us. Yeah, exactly. And and this is kind of maybe a shift towards the type of personality that I was, you know, alluding to earlier. Like, is 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 this now going to, you know, this is this is like you said, this is bad news. You do, you do not want this guy to like start getting comfortable in this position of power, because um, that it just seems like that's going to make a bad guy even worse. And, and, and yeah, he, he takes to it. He, he, he loves it. And we just watched him sit in that carriage and not get love from his mother and talk about how his dad hated him. And so all of a sudden, like get, getting this type of response, um, from the people out there is really like, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's gassing him up. So, uh, it's, it's dangerous. I, I think the real quick on the conqueror's crown, my feeling was like, that's the crown that they use at an ascension. And then you get to like, you know, have your own fancy one made. Oh, that's interesting. We'll see if he has on a different one in the finale, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Who, uh, who knows? I'm not, I'm not totally sure. But, but the way they said it's been like passed down for, you know, generations or whatever made me think that, that all Targaryen kings wear that one at some point, maybe. Interesting. Um, this is our big moment when Renice obviously comes up through the floor of the, where are they? Do you, are you aware where this was? There's somewhere in the Red Keep. It's not the throne room, but it's like the, uh, yeah, I don't know, the mess hall, maybe. I'm not sure. But, I mean, it but, seems uh, like it was above the dragon pit, no? Didn't she have to go get her dragon out of the dragon pit, maybe? Yeah, she she, she sneaks off to the dragon pit, yes. And, uh, and, and yeah, obviously gets a dragon now, 
somewhere under this thing. So yeah, it might be right. It's either near the dragon pit or, or right on top of it. It just occurred to me live on the microphone that this is Helena's prophecy, the beast beneath the boards. <laughs> Which is, yeah. which is, it is exactly like Ozark because it doesn't fucking matter. The, why was that the thing she harped on for two episodes? There's a beast beneath the boards. If the only point is to tell us that she's psychic, we already know that. Now they're just laying it on thick. Oh, look, yeah. she predicted another thing. We get it. What she says really, really matters. I'm still curious about uh, a couple of her poems from a couple episodes ago, but now we, this is, this is that one for sure. Beast yeah, the, beneath oh, the yeah. boards. Here it comes. Sup. Up from beneath the floorboards, it goes. That is correct. Uh, I think she killed probably a good 200 random peasants who were forced to go to this, by the way. No real care for the people here from Anise. Uh, look, uh, okay. I, I think it's time to talk about this moment. Um, from the inside of the episode, my takeaway is that they created this moment. This yes. is not something that necessarily existed at all in the book. That is, do, you, do you concur with that? Is that? Was that your read That as well? was my read, yes. Okay. So it, it was a great fun moment. Um, you know, give me a giant screeching dragon with like a badass armored woman on top of it. And like, I'm going to think that's cool, but it, 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 it did feel like they, it's like they talked about it being forced and it kind of read that way too, because they talk about how like, it's her moral compass. It's her moral duty as a mother, which is why she doesn't just end the war right here by Dracara saying, all of these people on stage, boom, war over. But like you just said, okay, well, wh where was the, the moral forethought when she just exploded out of the boards and killed 150 peasants? Yeah, that's it's <laughs> it's hard to make that add up. And man, you know what? When I, when I was watching the inside of the episode and Sapochnik said that we were looking for our penultimate moment and we thought about this, I went, oof, I wish you hadn't yeah. said that because it yeah, really, should. really stood out that they forced this in there Yep. And I and here's the thing. It's dangerous to create a moment that can end all of the moments that follow. Totally. If something 100%. had gone differently. Yep. And the way Renice sits there with her dragon pointed at Aegon and Alicent and Otto and this all the greens on stage. And she could have ended this whole thing in one Dracarys right there. Yep. And then she pulls back and flies off only to go tell Allison or to go tell Rhaenyra in Dragonstone, yep. hey, yes. here's what's happening. Makes no sense strategically. It, no, it doesn't add up. It really doesn't because she, she knows that with the information that she delivers to Rhaenyra and Damon, they're all going like, to die. But yes, that that's going to put the lives of everybody that is standing up there on that stage at risk anyway, and that there will be a war where many of those people need to die in the you know in in the 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 pursuit of uh of the iron throne for Rhaenyra's claim so it, it it's uh yeah i i i really like i feel like there was a there was a way to g still give us like a cool dragon moment with Renice here as she absconds you know like and and escapes this imprisonment basically um obviously it it might not have been dramatic as coming up through the boards like that and 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 busting out of the castle, but uh, but this one was a bit of a head scratcher because of exactly what you just said here. It, it it creates a moment that could have easily ended all the moments that come after that, and in fact makes more sense for her to have taken the opposite action. And while um, now I say all that knowing that they could full well reinforce her actions from this week with next week's episode, so that. And I have to hope that there's some version of that that takes place because just from a general storytelling standpoint, this was probably the weakest moment of the show so far in that it was forced in that it was sort of this like plot mechanism to serve as a penultimate moment that yep. really didn't carry the weight that, that a, a regular penultimate moment would. And we right. didn't really need it. Um, I agree. I don't think we did. Now, you could have ended the episode on on dude with his hands over his head and the crowd going nuts right there. We already know we're screwed. It was obviously powerful in some way to get Renice sort of coming up through the floorboards being like, I am not going to sit here and be forced into what you people want to force me into. I am out. And the one really like logical moral standpoint I can think of that would make sense is like, look, I'm not willing to kill all of you right here, but I'm going to point my dragon at you and really let you think about it. 
then I'm going to leave and you're going to know that I'm coming back with more of these. Right. So maybe you should all bail. And I, and it's gotta be the reason it's gotta be that she thinks maybe they'll leave. Maybe they'll know this is no longer a good idea because she's going to Dragonstone. We already know Damon and Rhaenyra have been stockpiling dragons like fucking hotcakes up there for, for 10 years now, many dragons they can get their hands on. So yeah, I think there's, there's, I talked about a moment that I liked earlier in this episode where uh, Sir Harold, Sir, Sir White Star, Whiting Star, Wit Star, what's his, the Lord Lord Commander of the King's Guard? Uh, something like that, yeah. Um, but I believe Harold is his first name, so we'll just go with Sir Harold. It, so when, when right when he leaves and he's basically like, I'm not touching this. Westerling. It, Westerling, thank you. Uh, that, that That's like... It's sort of a parallel because e- even though Renice is obviously going to go tell the other side what's what's happened in a way it's like we get those moments with her talking to Allison telling her that she has you know more wisdom or 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 more wit than she kind of thought um bonding over like some kind of you know women that are put upon uh their their mothers they they've kind of been run over by men in their lives so so there 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 is this this idea if you want to talk yourself into it that she's basically like it's not my place to to end this here. Well, and she like, can't kill him without killing Allison too. Allison stands in front of him, right? Right. So, so that has to and, be it. Yeah. That, and that that's kind of what they I think try to explain in the inside of the episode is that like she's not going to kill Allison there. Like that, like she doesn't think that 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 at least that one person on the stage is is not fully deserving of of, of that. The more we go um, through it, the more I'm able to talk myself into the moment. But it's still, it is the one that stands out as like, okay, what was that? You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, I do wish she just fried everybody. Of course, of course. But but uh, but then then we don't have have a show to continue. So so in the end, it's it it it's good that she didn't. But <laughs> it's true. Um, but definitely one that that we'll have to to kind of think more on and and maybe hopefully get a little bit more of an explanation about it next episode. So obviously you and I will spend more time uh, later this week on patreon.com slash oysters, clams, cockles, further breaking this thing down with the help of hotline calls from our listeners. But Barrett, just to close this thing out, what were your, what were your general thoughts on, on this, this kind of different penultimate episode first season of house of the dragon? I I thought that, after episode seven and eight, which were arguably the two best of the season so far, that this was a little bit of a downswing. But um, aside from, you know, aside from my expectations being subverted with less fireworks than I thought, uh, you know, I, you kind of had to expect a, a setup episode somewhere in here, right? Uh, as as you deal with the fallout of, of Viserys croaking. So, um, yeah, you know, I thought it was interesting that we didn't, we didn't get Rhaenyra at all here. We didn't get any of the, of the, uh, of the blacks in this no episode. No Rhaenyra, no Damon. We didn't get any of their perspective. Uh, obviously they didn't know about the information that, that happened. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the good things, which were the, the, the takeaways, the, the kind of the inner fractures that we st- saw start to form within the green camp between Alice and Otto and between Amond and Aegon. Um, and even between, you know, Kristen and Sir Harold or Kristen and the Erics or the Erics not being aligned. So there were a lot of there were there were a lot of kind of small moments like that that I think could pay dividends later. Um, but it, it it definitely it's got me itching for the finale. I'll say that it's it's I'm, I'm looking for I'm looking for another really solid, really great episode to close us out here. And I want closure on what I'll call the Viserys season, right? Like, I want to see how this thing wraps up and sets us up for season two. How much are we going to bite off in the finale? Is it just going to be the very beginning of the conflict or what? Yeah. What, what exact, how does the ball roll into season two from one is really what I'm, I'm looking most forward to seeing, especially knowing that there aren't going to be as many time jumps. I, I predict that we will get a character death, like a, like a medium, a medium to large character death. Uh, in the finale, 
but I, I don't, I don't think we're headed for all out war next week. I think that that is, I think that's season two. I think the war is season two. I think you're right. You got to save that for season two, but I do think next week, what we'll end up getting is sort of the blacks version of what we got this week's from the greens, right? Viserys right, dies right. in episode eight. Episode nine is the greens response to that death. Episode yep. 10 is the Blacks' response to that death, and then sort of a mix at the end, I would guess, is is the direction we're going. Um, this one, all in all, for me, other than the moment with Renice that became very questionable in my mind after watching the inside of the episode, before that, honestly, it, w- something about it rang wrong to me, but it didn't fully set me off like, oh, what the hell is this? I was just like, okay, that wasn't as cool as you guys think it was, and maybe makes me have a lot of questions. They even say in the inside of the episode, we think a lot of people will be upset about this. Like, <laughs> And I was like, no, they, yeah, they, because you just created a moment that could have ended all of the story. So they, it just it gives a, a lot of weight. This was an example of, of a moment in, in, in pre, pretty much every single inside the episode um, up until this point, uh, I thought was extremely helpful for... Uh, you know, just kind of digesting the episode and the season and the storytelling as a whole. This is the first time where I think they kind of put their foot in their mouths. And I think that the inside of the episode was unhelpful because it's, I'm, I'm with you. I, I, that, that dragon moment happened and I was like, oh, okay. And, and, and like you, I, you know, it didn't, I didn't fully buy it, but it didn't really, it didn't bother me. And then as soon as I heard those words that it was, they, they needed, they needed that penultimate moment. They created this moment. Like the the way that they were phrasing it, I was like, oh, the wait, negativity no, came oh, in. No. All the negativity yeah. came in. And if you remember, Barrett, back on Game yeah. of Thrones, Benioff and Weiss <laughs> would routinely make blunders in these. Yep. Like the way they would say people's names, they would mispronounce major character names, like stuff that I do. But I'm not the showrunner. I'm just a simple podcaster. So I'll say this. Sapochnik and Condal have done a much better job than Benioff and Weiss thus far. But it was Benioff and Weiss in the later seasons without Germs. Yes, you know, uh, help is when they started to falter in these uh, after the episode, inside the episode interview room. Uh, the uh, the the infamous forgetting the Iron Fleet moment, right? Unbelievable, <laughs> unbelievable. But I love the episode. I did think the moment with Renice was strange. Outside of that, it was it wasn't what I expected, and that's kind of why I enjoyed it. It did have some of these. Um, more classic Game of Thrones, like buddy cop conversational moments where you get a little more insight into some of our side characters. We spent yeah, no yeah. time with Damon and Rhaenyra. And then, of course, there's this huge moment for Renice that really gives her an even more complicated um, character herself, but it's also difficult to kind of make yourself fully believe and buy into. So I'm, I'm just interested to see how they further develop Renice based on that moment. I don't think For they sure. would have done that unless they had thought it played better into something else down the line. So something to keep a, an eye on and keep a pin on. Definitely possible. Um, all good stuff, though. Very, very excited to see how they wrap this thing up. And I really don't know how much to expect next week. That's why... It is so exciting. I really don't know. I mean, there hasn't been... Look, if you look back to Game of Thrones Season 1, was it not Episode 9 where... Uh, I won't say, I, I guess, who it is in case any of you haven't watched Thrones yet, but the, a major character death occurs, and it sort of leaves everybody to pick up the pieces in the finale. Right. I don't know. I've not, I haven't been in this situation before with a, a Game of Thrones property, so I'm excited. Go to bowlandmedia.com slash shop and get yourself some OCC merch. We've got Party Like Damon, Slay Like Rhaenyra t-shirts. We've got Party Like Aegon, Slay Like Aemon shirts that probably don't work anymore. Yeah, you probably don't want to buy that one now anymore. Now that he turned into a sicko <laughs> criminal. So we'll probably just take those down. But we do have new OCC logo hats and shirts as well. Those are nice and, and family friendly for everybody who's not a sex criminal. Uh, Bolin Media, B-O-L-E-N media.com slash shop. Get yourself some OCC merch. And as I said, Barrett and I will be back later this week on Patreon.com slash Oysters, Clams, Cockles to further discuss and dissect this episode with hotline calls driven uh, or called in by the Mollusk Militia, as it were. Go to Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Oysters, Clams, Cockles today. Join the Crustacean Nation or the Mollusk Militia. Just $5 minimum to support our show, and you'll immediately gain access to our entire backlog of all our hotline episodes from this season. And uh, yeah and support the show 
as well. If you want to call into the hotline for this final or for the penultimate episode and the final episode next week, you have to join the Mollusk Militia. That's the $10 tier on patreon.com slash oysters, clams, cockles. You'll also gain access to our Discord as well in the Mollusk Militia. Follow us on social media. We're on TikTok at oysters, clams, and cockles. On Instagram at oysters, clams, cockles. On Twitter, clams and cockles. At Barrett Dudley on Twitter and Instagram to follow Mr. Barrett. I am Ross Bolin at WR Bolin on Twitter and Instagram. And you can listen to the Ross Bolin podcast wherever you listen to OCC. We're on YouTube all season long. YouTube, we appreciate you hanging in there with us. Uh, there's at least 3,000 of you watching every, every week on YouTube. We really appreciate you this week. We did have to do the Zoom, so it is a little bit different. I did want to remind everybody. As, a, as further incentive to get on patreon.com slash oysters, clams, cockles and support the show. Between seasons one and two, we will be upgrading the studio and setting it up so it is YouTube friendly and getting more cameras and doing all kinds of cool stuff. So we appreciate your support in helping us do that. Bolin Media is a, is a very small media company in Austin, Texas. we got three full-time employees and some contract people like Barrett and my wife sells our ads and it's uh, it's very bootstrapped down here, so we appreciate everybody who can go to patreon.com slash oysters, clams, cockles and support us, or go to bowlinmedia.com slash shop and buy merch. And uh, watch our episodes on YouTube, like I said. We'll be back later this week, patreon.com slash oysters, clams, cockles, with further discussion and analysis. Until next time, clam fam. Valar Morgulis.